See, so, yeah, really a great pleasure to uh, to be here, and thanks to all of you for uh, for coming today. It's exciting for me to be talking about these uh, these issues uh, with you. The title of my talk is Reality Plus from the Matrix to the Metaverse, and I'll explain that title as we uh, as we go along. I'll be talking about themes from the book that uh, that Tom mentioned, uh, Reality Plus. Just uh, just published today. There's a the uh, the American cover has a butterfly. The uh, the UK cover has some clouds. If you look closely at both of them, you'll see a couple of a few digital glitches to uh, indicate uh, indicate virtuality. I'll be discussing some of the uh, of the themes from uh, from this book today, but in a uh, in a standalone way. I mean, the anchors for my uh, for my talk are two very well-known virtual worlds from science fiction, the matrix and the metaverse. Um, you all know the matrix, I assume. Uh, the first movie came out in 99. There were two sequels in 2003. And we have just now, about a month ago, had the fourth matrix, matrix movie, the matrix resurrections. For my purposes, I like the matrix idea, especially because it's a wonderful illustration of the idea of an entire simulated universe. Illustrates what's sometimes known as the simulation hypothesis, the hypothesis that we might be living in a simulation right now. So for me, the matrix represents the whole, the idea of an entire simulated universe and that our universe might be a simulation as it turns out to be in the matrix. Neo takes the, uh, takes the red pill, wakes up and realizes that you know his whole life had been in a simulation the matrix so that's kind of an extreme example of a uh, of a virtual world the other anchor point is the metaverse uh, now the metaverse comes from a, a novel by neil St stevenson in 1992 snow crash here's my uh, my paperback copy where it was you know a rather large virtual world that people entered temporarily and used for all forms of work and play, employment, relationships. Um, and these days, of course, the term metaverse has been widely propagated by people in the tech industry, most notably uh, Mark Zuckerberg in his recent rebranding of Facebook as a company called Meta because of their ambitions to... Uh, to become you know, the uh, progenitors of a kind of metaverse. And here a metaverse represents, again, a kind of virtual world or a system of virtual worlds that people will actually use for everyday endeavors, um, you know, maybe for work, maybe for communication, for play, and so on. It's a little bit different from the, uh, the Stevenson idea, not least because uh, the idea is the metaverse is analogous to the entire internet. It's like an immersive internet made up of many virtual worlds. But yeah, so, so where the matrix represents the extreme case of the universe as a simulation, the metaverse to me represents real virtual reality coming, the coming virtual reality technology of the coming decades that we may actually use. And what I'm going to do is to try and start with the case of the meta of the matrix and use that to shed light on the more realistic case of the metaverse. But my topic, you know, my central topic is virtual worlds and virtual reality. So I'm a philosopher and we, and we like to define our terms where we can. So what's a virtual world? As I understand it, a virtual world is an interactive, computer-generated world. This covers an awful lot. Here's my first virtual world. It was a text-based virtual world that I came across in 1976 when I was 10 years old. It's a colossal cave adventure. And you interact with the, uh, the world of colossal cave adventure by putting in commands like go north, go south, pick up the water, and so on. But it's, it was a it's a computer generated world and it's interactive. So this counts as a very simple virtual world. 
for me. Here are some others. Uh, the video games that came in the years to come. Here's Space Invaders, a very simple virtual world that you interact with. Here's our World of Warcraft. More recently, a more complex, heavily graphics-driven, three-dimensional virtual world. Here's Second Life, probably still the most prominent example of a virtual world used for, uh, for social purposes rather than gaming purposes, as in the case of World of Warcraft. But still, uh, Second Life, World of Warcraft is still played largely on two-dimensional screens, not through you know, an immersive virtual reality headset. Virtual reality, by contrast, I take to be an immersive virtual world. That is an immersive interactive computer generated world. And the new condition of immersiveness says you, know, you, have, you experience these worlds around you three dimensionally as if you were in the world at the center. So typically these days, virtual reality is experienced using a headset such as here, the Oculus Quest 2 headset, which has a, uh, a headset that you, uh, you put on your face and a couple of controllers in your hand and you go in there and you experience a virtual world all around you. Um, here's someone playing Beat Saber, a uh, wonderful game inside the, uh, inside the Oculus Quest. Uh, here's VR Chat, one of the most prominent uh, social virtual worlds in current VR. Um, here's, I think this is Magic Leap Glasses for Augmented Reality, a closely related uh, technology where you get to experience digital or virtual objects among the physical objects. You see the physical world, but you also see virtual objects in a kind of mixed reality. So both the matrix and the metaverse are or closely involve virtual worlds. The matrix is one giant virtual world, immersive, interactive, computer generated. So is Stevenson's metaverse. And Zuckerberg's metaverse is perhaps best seen as a system of interconnected virtual worlds. So I'm gonna um, try to think philosophically about virtual worlds and virtual reality. I think of this as a philosophical inquiry into the status of virtual reality, starting with some very abstract philosophical questions, but gradually bringing it home to some more practical questions at the same time. I think of this, what I'm doing here is what I like to call techno-philosophy. The idea behind techno-philosophy is a two-way interaction between philosophy and technology. On the one hand, using philosophy to shed light on technology, thinking philosophically about technologies such as virtual reality technology. In principle, you can do this with all kinds of technology, smartphones, the internet, AI but here, virtual reality, but also using technology to shed light on philosophy. I think that thinking about technology can very often provide input uh, to make progress on very traditional philosophical problems, the mind-body problem. How do you know anything about the external world? Is there a God? The nature of value, what's a good life? It's part, I believe that thinking heavily about, thinking hard about virtual reality in particular can shed light on some of those questions. So today I want to do a little bit of techno philosophy. This name, by the way, is inspired by what the philosopher Patricia Churchland has called neurophilosophy, which was using philosophy to shed light on neuroscience, but also using neuroscience to shed light on philosophy. I want to adapt that idea to think about, to thinking about the relationship between philosophy and technology. So my central thesis, when it comes to virtual reality and virtual world is that virtual reality is genuine reality. There's a long tradition of thinking of virtual reality as some kind of fake reality. It's an illusion, it's a fiction, it's mere escapism. What goes on there isn't real. This sometimes gets encoded into you know, expressions people use like IRL, in real life, there's, there's VR and there's real life or the real world. I wanna say that in a certain sense, that's a mistaken way of thinking. Virtual reality is genuine reality. It's different from physical reality, probably different from physical reality, but nonetheless, 
a first-class reality in its own right. That thesis breaks down into uh, to at least three separate theses. The first is that virtual reality is not an illusion or a fiction. Objects in VR are real objects, events in VR really happen. They needn't be illusory or fictional at all. Objects in virtual reality may be digital objects, but they're still perfectly real for all that. Second, we can lead a meaningful life in virtual reality. In principle, you know, people may well end up spending more and more of their lives in, uh, in VR, perhaps working, perhaps building relationships, and so on. It'll be very limited at first, but as the technology progresses, it will expand. Some people are going to say that's only ever going to be escapism. I think that in principle, one can lead as meaningful a life in VR as in physical reality. There, you know, there are upsides and downsides uh, for both, but it's at least a rational, will be rational for some people to, uh, to lead their lives in VR eventually. Third, this now connects to the simulation idea, we might actually be in a virtual reality already. It's not part of my thesis to say we are actually in a simulation. I don't say that, um, but it is a prospect I take seriously. And I do think it's one that we can't rule out. Uh, we can't know that we're not in a simulation. And so in a certain sense, you know, I wanna say that just as virtual reality is genuine rea reality, I wanna say physical reality may well itself be a form of virtual reality, whether it's a simulation or even in other ideas suggested by contemporary physics, physical reality itself may have elements of virtual reality. So those are my three central theses. And the way I'll approach them is to start with the last one, the idea of you know, the universe as a simulation, talk about that. And then that's kind of the extreme case of a virtual world and then draw it back to apply to uh, the more practical case of coming virtual reality, reality technology. Yeah, so for this first part, the, uh, the topic is the simulation hypothesis, the extreme case of you know, a matrix-like virtual world. Could we be living ourselves in a computer simulation? The so-called simulation hypothesis says we are ourselves in a lifelong computer simulation. And you might say, well, why should we, uh, why should we believe that? Okay, here's a picture of a uh, computer simulation. This is the, uh, the matrix, which also shows two ways of being in a simulation. This is, uh, this is Trinity and the Oracle talking to each other. I think this was in one of the sequels. Uh, it turns out that actually the Oracle is herself a simulated creature. She's one of the machines. So she is uh, herself generated as part of the simulation. That's what I call a pure sim, a pure simulated creature. Whereas Trinity jacks in to, uh, to the matrix, you know, but she still has a biological brain and body and her brain connects to the matrix. That's what I call a bio sim, a biological being connecting to the matrix. So here are two different ways that we could be in a simulation, biological beings connecting to a simulation or uh, purely digital beings. For present purposes, we don't have to choose one of these over, over the other. They're both versions of the simulation hypothesis. Then the question arises, you know, once we start talking about, it looks like there are gonna be universe simulations like this eventually, simulation technology is getting better and better. Eventually they may be indistinguishable from the physical world, which raises the question, the philosophical question about knowledge. How do you know you're not in a simulation right now? And it looks like it's hard to see how you can have any conclusive evidence that you're not in a simulation. Maybe you think, I don't know, maybe you think your, your cat is so delightfully playful that that could never be simulated or this beautiful forest could never be simulated or these other people could never be simulated. But it just looks like for any evidence you might have that you're not in a simulation, that evidence could in principle be simulated. So a simulation could just build that in it would be indistinguishable. So it's hard to see how you could ever conclusively demonstrate that you're not in a simulation. This idea goes back in so many philosophical traditions, you can find versions of this idea. 
I mean, admittedly, the ancient traditions didn't put it in terms of a computer because they didn't have computers. But look, for example, ancient Chinese philosophy, where the Taoist philosopher Guangzhou uh, put forward his parable of the butterfly dream, where he says, well, he just woke up from a dream where he was dreaming he was a butterfly. But now, am I Guangzhou who dreamed he was a butterfly? Or am I a butterfly dreaming he's Zhuangzhou? It's how do I know I'm not dreaming right now that I'm a Zhuangzhou, that I'm, that I'm Zhuangzhou? That's a classic version, a classic analog of the simulation hypothesis. You also find this in, in René Descartes in his uh, Meditations on First Philosophy, a work that some people see as you know, the start of, of modern philosophy in the, uh, in the 17th century. Descartes said, how do you know your senses aren't fooling you right now? How do you know you're not dreaming right now? How do you know an evil demon isn't deceiving you by producing sensations of an external world? These are all versions of what philosophers call skeptical hypotheses, hypotheses where nothing is real that try to undercut your knowledge. Here's, a, here's an illustration of this uh, where the, the evil demon is messing with you by feeding you sensations. This is a high tech evil demon. They get to use simulation technology. The evil demon is, is messing with you to produce experiences as of an external world around you. Descartes famously goes on to say, ah, oh, well, there's still something I know for sure. I am here thinking. I exist. He goes, I think, I'm thinking, therefore I am. I exist. So even if, while I'm doubtful about the external world, I can be sure that I exist. But Descartes at least thought, you know, we had very serious reasons here to doubt the external world. By the way, all these are the illustrations I'm, I'm showing here. These are illustrations by Tim Peacock, who's the wonderful illustrator that came up with a uh, 57 illustrations uh, from my book to try and bring out these philosophical ideas. So this is Tim's version of, of an evil demon. These days, you can ask these Cartesian questions, you know, directly using the technology, the technology of simulation. We put those questions of Descartes by asking, how do you know you're not in a simulation? And in some ways, the issues here are like those for Descartes' hypotheses, but in some ways they become more serious in the context of technology. It improves on the evil demon in at least one respect. That with the development of VR technology, it's actually now becoming a serious possibility that we have simulations like this. VR technology is really being developed. This will actually be possible before long. So it's no longer a mere science fiction possibility. It's becoming a serious possibility for technology in our world. You know, you could actually take, Descartes said, you know, I couldn't really be fooled into thinking that I'm sitting by the fire with this paper in my hand, but yeah, for all Descartes knows, he might actually be in VR, which gives him an experience just like, uh, just like this. So VR in a way is making these old Cartesian problems even more serious by making them more realistic. Nick Bostrom has also put forward an argument that some of you may know that, uh, you know, simulated worlds may turn out to greatly outnumber unsimulated worlds, because simulation technology will be so widely used, maybe it could be that most beings in the universe end up being simulated. And then you say, what are the odds that I'm unsimulated? Maybe it's more likely I'm in a simulation. Oh, here's an illustration of, yeah, Bertrand Russell said, ordinary reality is the simplest hypothesis, so maybe we should believe in that. And here I have Bostrom uh, saying back, ah, oh, but there may actually be many more simulations in which case we should expect a simulation in a way to be the default hypothesis. All the more reason to take this seriously. So, you know, Descartes used this as an argument that we can't know anything. You know, we can't know, first premise, we can't know we're not in a simulation. Second premise, if we're in a simulation, nothing is real. Conclusion, we can't know anything is real. So I actually accept the, uh, the first premise. I accept we can't know we're not in a simulation. That's the, uh, I basically argued for that now. That was the first of my three main claims. I think we can't rule out that we're in a simulation. It's a serious possibility. Descartes used that in an argument like this to argue then that we can't know anything is real because if we're in a simulation, nothing is real. That's the part that I want to, uh, I want to resist. 
So here, you know, the common view of, uh, of simulations and of virtual reality is simulations are illusions. Virtual reality is illusory reality. And you remember, I want to resist this view. I think virtual reality is genuine reality. So although I agree with Descartes that we can't know we're not in a simulation, I totally reject the idea that simulations are illusions. So here's, here's Cornell West, the American philosopher expressing this, this idea. Uh, Cornell West himself acted in, the, uh, in the, the sequels to The Matrix playing counselor west of Zion. Here we have him, you know, he was in The Matrix, he escapes to Zion, then he escapes to the US. Um, but Cornell West actually says in his commentary on the movie, it's illusions all the way down. This is a very, very common view. Everything in simulated reality is illusions, maybe in physical reality too. But it's a view I want to, uh, I want to resist. My view is simulations need not be illusions. If we're in a perfect simulation, like the matrix, the world around us is still perfectly real. It's a digital world to be sure, but the objects are still real. There are still tables and chairs, there are still planets and people. You know, in the, uh, in the matrix, we have Neo saying, this isn't real. Morpheus comes back by saying, what is real? How do you define real? Morpheus here is, you know, he's a paradigm philosopher. What even do you mean by real? Define your terms, please. How do you define real? How do you define real? Well, there's a lot of things you might mean with the word real, but here are at least, I think, three central things we care about when we say something is real. Something is real if it makes a difference, if it has causal powers in the world, it actually affects things. Something is real if it isn't all in the mind. If something is all in the mind, then often we treat it as less real, but if it's external to the mind, it's real. And third, something is real if it isn't an illusion. Um, I got that back. Something is real if it isn't an illusion. Uh, if something is an illusion, then we, say, then we say somehow it's not real. So I want to say that if we're in a simulation, the objects around us are real. Okay, I've got a keyboard which is doing something a little bit crazy here. Um, let me just try and disconnect this keyboard, which is... Um, okay, let me just... Uh... So I want to say that if we are in a simulation, The objects around us are real. There is, they're digital objects, but they make a difference. They're not all in the mind and they're not illusions. So what I wanna say is the following. The simulation hypothesis is a version of the so-called it from bit hypothesis, often taken seriously within physics. The it from bit hypothesis says that everything in the physical world is made of bits. We're living in a universe grounded in bits. And this is a hypothesis that physicists take seriously and they don't regard this as the hypothesis where the world is, is an illusion. It's just the world is made of bits. My argument is that if we're in a simulation, we're living in a universe where the world is made of bits, objects in the world are made of bits, but they're still perfectly real. Here's an, here's an illustration of this. Here's like on the left-hand side, we've got a traditional God creating the world by creating bits. Here's how, it's what I call the it from bit creation hypothesis. God creates, God creates some bits that make atoms, that make molecules, that make the world. On the right-hand side, we have the simulation version of this. The simulator, who I'm thinking of now as a teenage girl in the next universe up. A simulator is programming a computer, thereby creating a world of bits, thereby, crea thereby creating all the objects in this world digital objects. And I'm gonna say the simulation version is equivalent to the it from bit version and the objects are just as real. So if that's right, you know, then if we're in a simulation, objects are real, they're just made of bits. So yes, we could be in a simulation, but if we're in a simulation, things are still perfectly real. They're just digital. So that gives us, you know, virtual reality, is at least halfway to virtual reality is genuine reality. Virtual reality is genuine reality. It's just digital. And then, okay, so that's the matrix, the matrix part. Now I want to kind of bring it home by talking about a less extreme case 
uh, the case of the metaverse, the coming virtual reality technology. So the metaverse, yes, Stevenson's version was a single massive social virtual world. Zuckerberg's version is something like a global interconnected system of virtual worlds, the immersive internet. The metaverse idea is continuous with kind of realistic VR, the kind of VR that people are using now, even with a say Oculus Quest headsets. In real VR, as opposed to matrix style simulations, you don't spend your whole life there. You go into VR for a while, then you come out, you know you're using VR, unlike the matrix case perhaps, and it's much, much simpler than a universe simulation. But I wanna say some of the same morals of the, uh, the simulation case also extend to the metaverse and to real VR. Now, again, there's this common line that VR is an illusion or a hallucination. William Gibson and Neuromancer said, defined cyberspace, by which I think he meant virtual reality, as a consensual hallucination experienced daily. By definition, he defined it as a hallucination. Again, I want to resist this idea that VR has to be an illusion or a hallucination. In the movie Ready Player One, you hear at one point, reality is the only thing that's real, by which they seem to mean physical reality is the only thing that's real. Again, I think that's a philosophical mistake. I think digital reality is real too. So the standard view is virtual objects are unreal, they're illusions, hallucinations, or fictions. My view is virtual objects are real. They're non-illusory digital objects. And you can see why my view of the simulation case and the matrix case would generalize naturally to thinking about VR this way. Virtual objects really do make a difference when you're using a, a VR headset. There are real digital objects doing real things. I mean, if we're in a full-scale simulation like the matrix, the objects we're interacting with are real digital objects running on a computer. You know, if I'm, if I'm in the matrix right now, then this apparent physical book is actually, a, is actually a digital book that I'm interacting with. I think you can generalize that point even to ordinary VR. The objects we're interacting with are real digital objects, they're data structures concretely running on a computer. Real objects you're interacting with, just digital objects. Here I've got this example, of, we've got a biological kitten, we've got a robot kitten, and we've got a, uh, a virtual kitten. Now I agree that a robot kitten is not a real, it's not a biological kitten. We wouldn't normally say it's just a kitten, it's a real kitten, but it's still a real, it's a real object. My own view is that virtual kittens are at least as real as robot kittens. They're digital, which makes them different kinds of entities, but it has just as many causal powers, it's just as real as a robot kitten. A robot kitten is a real thing in the world. It's not an illusion. I mean, it's not exactly the same as a biological kitten. It's digital, but it's nonetheless real. I want to say the same thing for the, uh, the virtual kitten. One, another question is whether VR is an illusion. You might say, okay, virtual objects are real. I accept that they're real digital objects, but you might say nonetheless, it's an illusion because things seem to be out there in physical space where they're not. And I think maybe some users of VR get this kind of illusion. Novice users of VR, using VR for the first time, they may experience objects as being out there in physical space, which is an illusion. But expert users of VR experience objects as being in virtual space. They know they're in VR. They interpret the objects around them as being in VR, as in virtual space. And that's not an illusion. When I see an object in front of me, in VR, I think, yeah, there really is a virtual object in front of me in virtual space. I think expert users have non-illusory perception of virtual world. So I think VR needn't be an illusion. The final question is the one about value and meaning. Can you have a meaningful life in a virtual world? Can life in VR be as good or for some people better than life in non-virtual reality? And I want to say yes to both questions. Um, you, know, you might, you might uh, be led to worry about this. Plato in, in Plato's cave said, 
uh, maybe we're just seeing shadows on the cave wall and none of this is real. And he thought that kind of life was not as good. Here's an updated version, Plato's Cave for the 21st Century. That's Mark Zuckerberg on the, on the laptop uh, with, the, uh, with the people all strapped in watching, seeing virtual reality. You might think, okay, this is trying to pump the intuition that virtual reality has to be second class, not as real. But that's actually what I want to reject. Another version of this idea of the, the idea that VR is not as meaningful was put forward by the American philosopher Robert Nozick in his book, Anarchy, State, and Utopia, where he talked about the experience machine. An experience machine is this machine that gives you amazing experiences of being the world's best at what you do, having wonderful family, wonderful relationships, all kinds of pleasure, everything is good. But in fact, your body is floating in a tank. In this illustration, we're kind of going with the idea that Nozick should have realized or should have thought that he himself was in the experience machine. Successful professor at Harvard, winning the National Book Award, prime candidate for experiences from an experience machine. Anyway, so Nozick asked the question, should you enter the experience machine pre-programming wonderful experiences for life? And he wanted to say no. He said no. And there seem to be at least three reasons for this. The experience machine is pre-programmed. It has no autonomy. You're just living out a script in the experience machine. The experience machine is illusory. None of the things you think you're doing are actually happening. They're just illusions, no reality. Third, he said, the experience machine is artificial. We want to be in contact with nature, with natural reality. This is all human made. I want to say none of those reasons are good reasons not to enter VR. For a start, VR is unlike the experience machine. VR is not pre-programmed. It's not scripted. It's interactive. In a, in a social virtual world, you can make your own life. You, can, you have free will. You can make your own, your own decisions. You can build relationships. You can build communities. So it's in no sense pre-programmed. Furthermore, I've argued it's not illusory. What, what you do in VR really happens. The actions you take in VR, you really perform. Third, yeah, VR may be artificial, but you know, so are cities. Many of us, I spend much of my life in New York City. Most of us spend most of our lives indoors. That's an artificial, that's an artificial reality, but it doesn't seem to be a blockade to living a meaningful life. So I think none of these reasons of Nozix are good reason not to enter VR. In my view, what, you know, what does give our lives meaning and value. I think our lives have meaning because of the experiences we have, the, uh, the relationships we have with other people, our projects and our achievements, and you know, more generally our desires and, and satisfying them, maybe things like knowledge and understanding. I think all of these values can in principle be present in VR. Yes, the reality around you is digital rather than physical, but you know, but we find meaning in physical objects. We invest them with meaning. I think we can do just the same for digital objects. It was true that VR may be missing some sources of value for some people. I don't want to say like it's superior in every respect. That would obviously be wrong. If you value nature, yeah, you'll get more nature in physical reality than in virtual reality. VR is by nature artificial. You don't get full-scale birth and death inside VR which for some people will be you know, a, lack of, a lack of one source of meaning. You don't get sheer physicality in VR. Some people may value sheer physicality. If you do, then, uh, then fine. But VR also has new sources of value, new bodies in principle. Um, remembering now that many people, their access to physical reality is not so perfect. Say aging people, disabled people, oppressed people. VR offers you know, new forms of embodiment in new communities they may have better access to, new forms of experience, you know, you can fly in, in VR, near unlimited space, an abundance of goods, instant travel. I don't say one of these is necessarily better than the other. In the long term, it's rational for some people to prefer physical reality, but also rational for others to prefer virtual reality. Here's an illustration of this, is there two people choosing there's like a virtual reality you can go to, get in, connect to VR, or terraform reality, a new planet somewhere 
in the uh, in the distance that's been terraformed, um, and two people are choosing to build new lives there. I think you can choose one. You can choose the other. There's nothing dictating that terraform is necessarily better than virtual reality just because one's physical and the other is digital. So I'd say you can live a meaningful life in VR. Life may be good or it may be awful, but the full scale of human experience is available. This connects to this question, which a lot of people worry about, is the prospect of life in VR, is it utopian or is it dystopian? I would say that it's got potential elements of both. If you're looking for utopia in VR, VR has new bodies, new forms of experience, near unlimited space, virtual abundance, you know, this idea that everyone can live near the beach, wonderful mansion, digital objects are so easy to, uh, to duplicate. So that if you want to be utopian, you can find it there. If you want to be dystopian, and there are many potentially dystopian elements of VR. Right now, virtual worlds are almost all governed by corporations. They're a form of corporatocracy or corporate gods. You know, we'll, maybe we'll have Apple reality and Facebook reality and Google reality. With each of these corporations controlling our worlds, this brings obvious privacy issues. These corporations are omniscient, they're omnipotent, which leads to all kinds of worries about manipulation. There's inevitably gonna be unequal access to these virtual worlds. There are worries about neglecting the physical world. So there are, yeah, I'd say that here there are many amazing potential upsides of VR, but also many perils, many promises, many, many perils. I don't want to minimize the perils, but I think the promises are amazing too. If I had to guess, I would say the, that the metaverse will be like the internet. It's brought wonderful things. It's also brought awful things. I'd like to think that in the case of the internet, the net value has been positive, despite all the awful things it's brought. Um, I'd like to think the same is true of the metaverse. Anyway, so then to, so to conclude my talk, to sum everything up, I'll just return to my original slogan, virtual reality is genuine reality. And I'll just add, the rest is up to us. Thank you.